Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for coming. Um, yes, I'm David Dissidorp from SUSE. I work in the storage team there. And I'll be talking about um, just a project I worked on uh, for a, a hack week at SUSE, um, which was basically uh, a USB Ceph gateway. So a quick, quick look at the agenda. Um, I'll start off just with a, an introduction to the project itself. Uh, we'll take a look at, or just uh, have an overview of Ceph. Hopefully you caught the talks, earlier, talks earlier about um, sort of the Ceph architecture and uh, how it solves all your storage problems. Um, a look at USB storage, so the USB storage stack in, in Linux. Um, then move on to a demonstration. So I'll do a live demo with uh, the board I have with me. Um, yeah, I have a, a Ceph cluster running on my laptop, so I'll sort of yeah, use that for the, for the test demo. And then look at um, how this could also be used for public storage, so uh, public cloud storage, so uh, where we have, say, uh, Amazon or uh, Azure behind the, the storage gateway. And finally, look at um, yeah, some future challenges. Uh, so what else could be done with a device like this or uh, this sort of project? And finish with a, a conclusion. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. So the project itself um, was sort of conceived with, with Hack Week. Um, so uh, as an engineer at SUSE, we get normally once or twice a year um, an event, or we have an event called Hack Week. And within Hack Week, we can work on whatever we feel like working on. So um, yeah, it's really a great time to sort of innovate within the company. Um, we can work on something which we're sort of passionate about. So in my case, it was I think a year or so ago now, I had I had an arm board, so a QB truck sort of gathering dust, got dust in the corner. Um, wanted to, to do something with it. I wanted to learn something new. Um, and I work on storage normally, so I thought, yeah, look, I'll combine these things and uh, create a, a USB storage gateway. Um, so in this case, we have uh, basically our, our USB host, so um, any stupid device with a USB port, which nowadays is pretty much everything. <laughs> um, I can then connect this USB gateway to my, my device uh, and basically access the Ceph cluster or the Ceph storage um, through USB. So the goals of the project, um, yeah, initially uh, my main goal was just to get something usable. Uh, so I thought, okay, this could then be, yeah, something at home. I could then potentially, say, run a Ceph cluster in my basement, then connect my stereo, my television, um, whatever else has a USB port, connect that and, and plumb it all into to Ceph for storage. Uh, another possibility would be booting from uh, the Ceph cluster. So most laptops nowadays can boot from USB. So you, know, you plug in the gateway, you boot straight from the, the Ceph cluster or the cloud storage. Encryption on the device itself. So um, in cases where I don't trust the, uh, the cloud storage, uh, especially for, for public cloud where I have no trust that they're gonna um, you know, keep my data safe. So I wanna do encryption on my side as close to, as close to the client as possible. Um, I can then keep the keys on, on the gateway carry that with me and yeah, don't share anything uh, with, with the public cloud or with the cloud. And finally, um, simple configuration. So uh, something like this, I didn't want to, to need to SSH into the, the board itself every time I wanted to change uh, the config there. So that was also a goal. So now I'll look at Ceph. Um, yeah, hopefully you caught the, the talks earlier. Um, it's, it's basically a project, uh, an amazing project, which uh, sort of uh, provides the ability to aggregate you know, a pool of hardware or the storage across that hardware um, and have a logical storage pool, which can then be carved up for, for block storage, for file system, for object storage. Um, yeah, it's scalable. There's no sort of single point of failure. Um, In this case, or in, 
for this project. Um, I'm mostly just focused on the Rados block device interface for Ceph. Um, so in this case, we have a, a block device image on the Ceph cluster, um, which is backed by uh, individual objects on the Ceph object store or Rados at the back end. So the Ceph RBD feature or interface has some quite cool features. Um, it offers, uh, yeah, it's thin provision, so basically you're not consuming space within your Ceph cluster until you're writing to uh, the image. Um, yeah, resizable, so you can grow and shrink your images there. You can also do things like snapshots and, and clones. And there's also, uh, yeah, support within the Linux kernel. So uh, with Linux, you can basically map a Rados block device image, it appears as a, a local block device and you could use that as you would any other disk. Um, on the user space side, there's uh, for QEMU um, yeah, integration so you can run virtual machines with QEMU and that's then backed by uh, Rados block device images on the set cluster. So now look at the hardware that I had um, for this uh, USB gateway project. So I started with uh, the top left there, which is a, a QB truck. Um, yeah, that's uh, so a, a dual core uh, Cortex 9. Uh, yeah, dual core A20, so all winner A20 board um, with uh, gigabit, uh, gigabit Ethernet. Um, yeah, what else does it have? So it's got a USB on the go port, which is obviously what's needed um, for this project. It has a bunch of other things on there which just really aren't, aren't required and yeah, uh, make the board a whole lot bigger and less portable. Um, so yeah, after that I moved on to the NanoPi Neo, uh, which is this board here. Uh, this is sort of, I think it's four centimeters by four centimeters, so it's very much something you could, or I could imagine carrying with me and you know, plugging it in and using it um, on the go. Um, both of them are relatively inexpensive, so the uh, NanoPi Neo is under $10. Uh, yeah, so certainly doable price-wise. Um, yeah, performance-wise, they're not great in that, or at least the NanoPi Neo has uh, 100 megabits network and, and USB 2, so um, yeah, it would be nice to try something with more powerful hardware, but um, yeah, at this stage, well, it wasn't um, a priority, so um, yeah, the big benefit of using these boards is that they have, uh, thanks to the uh, Sunsea community, uh, they have excellent mainline kernel support. Um, there's also a, an OpenSUSE Tumbleweed port for both boards, um, uh, which, which is something, you know, obviously working at SUSE, I wanted to run OpenSUSE on, on a board like that. Um, so USB storage, um, I won't go into uh, huge detail. Um, yeah, I'd recommend a talk by uh, Christoph Oparsiak. So he spoke yesterday on USB. It was a great talk sort of going through the details of USB on Linux. Um, this is just sort of listing what I used or what I needed to configure for this project. Uh, so USB is or can be used as a, a SCSI transport, um, which is how I'm using it in this case. Uh, so the two options there, bulk only transport and uh, USB attached SCSI. Uh, USB attached SCSI is then a, a, a more recent um, addition to, to USB and that allows for things like uh, command tag queuing um, and I think also out of order completion on, on USB 3. Uh, the USB gadget stack in Linux includes uh, two modules for, for handling this. Um, so we have the mass storage KO, um, which is what I ended up using, but there's also FTCM, which sort of plums into the uh, Linux kernel SCSI target. Uh, so that's basically a, a SCSI transport uh, for USB in Linux. So the, the gateway itself, um, as you saw, uh, all of the features are already there in Linux. Um, 
I mean, we have the Rudder Spot device kernel client. Uh, we have the USB gadget stack, which um, supports USB mass storage. There's really not that much to do. Uh, for encryption, there's uh, de-encrypt. Uh, in the end, the project itself was, or is mostly just about configuring these different components and making it you know, relatively easy to, to do that. So here's sort of a look at um, how the board's configured or um, yeah, how I've set up this, this gateway. Um, so basically what we have is um, yeah, a board that then boots uh, Linux once it's connected. Um, and initially we boot into, or we expose a, a configuration file system via USB. So this is just a, a RAM disk um, where you can yeah, you can provide your Ceph credentials to access the Ceph cluster. You can specify which image you want exposed via the board. Um, yeah, Lux key for de-encrypt. Um, and once you're done with that, uh, you can eject. Uh, so this is exposed as a, an ejectable uh, logical unit. Um, so once, once that is then ejected, um, we intercept that eject or we detect it and then basically process the user configuration. So basically, at that stage, we can you know, remount that image and take the set credentials and look at uh, what needs to be exposed and um, go ahead and do that and expose it via USB. So um, now on to the demo. <coughs> So as I already said, I have uh, my Ceph cluster running on my laptop. Um, so it's yeah, just a very simple vstart cluster. Um, let me just bring up console. Okay, uh, not really. So there you can see I have my Ceph cluster running uh, with three OSDs, one monitor. Um, these are all just local processes on the laptop. And now what I'll do is go ahead and, and connect to my gateway. So let's plug that in. Um, so one thing I should say I haven't really worked on optimizing is the boot time of the, the gateway itself. Um, so normally you would expect that you know, once you connect your USB key, you can immediately access the storage there. So uh, at this stage, it's still sort of in the tens of seconds until it boots and then eventually shows the configuration file system. So I'll just wait a little there. It's just coming up now. There we go. Um, so I have my device notification saying that there's a new uh, USB device. Um, so you can see this config file system here. So what this then has, uh, this is exposed, as I said earlier, as a RAM, or it's backed by a RAM disk. We have our RBD USB conf. So in here, basically, I'm saying, OK, I want to expose the uh, USB image on my RBD pool uh, within the Ceph cluster. Um, I have my Ceph user that I want to use there. Close that. Um, in this case, I have a uh, run conf flag. So what this basically says is that when the gateway boots, it should first expose the configuration file system, uh, which is what we're seeing here. So if I want it to boot immediately and expose Ceph, um, then what I can do is go ahead and delete that file. Um, de-encrypt, so that's where we configure our uh, de-encrypt Lux keys. And within Ceph, um, I just have the standard ceph.conf and the, the key ring there. So one thing I want to do is just copy uh, the ceph.conf and key ring uh, that I have for my Ceph cluster. Just do that from the command line. Good. 
So bring that back up. So now uh, the other thing I mentioned was that once we eject uh, this configuration file system, that uh, configuration is processed or committed, um, and we should then see the Rudder Spock device image appear, and there it is uh, as Seth down there. So basically, uh, the gateway has committed the, the configuration, uh, connects to the Ceph cluster on my laptop, and then maps it and exposes it via USB. Um, so here uh, we can see, whoops, that? so I have yeah, a one gigabyte uh, image there, which is, is now exposed and uh, connected by USB. Yes? Yes, I did. So in this case, I have a FAT file system on the device. Um, and I'll, I'll use, so the reason why I have it as, as FAT rather than EXT or XFS or ButterFS uh, is because I now wanted to demonstrate um, a, a stupid device accessing the, the Ceph storage. So what I have here is, is uh, just a stock Android mobile phone, which obviously has no knowledge of, of Ceph. Um, but what I can also do is uh, connect the USB gateway now to, to the Android phone. So in this case, Android supports FAT32 uh, as you know, USB stick. Um, so what I want to do <coughs> is then wait for the board to boot. And just so we've got some data to write to the Ceph cluster, a quick photo. Okay, um, and it should come up any time now. Hopefully, yes, there it is. So I'll just copy over that uh, photo to the gateway. So I basically see that as I would any other USB uh, storage device. And I'll copy that. And now I can go ahead and eject it. Done, so that's ejected. I can power down the, the gateway now. But what I'll do is use now just the um, Rados Block device client on my laptop just to map that image, just so we can confirm that uh, what we wrote, so this photo is, is actually there on the Ceph cluster. So I'm mapping I've mapped the USB image there. Just need to mount it as well. Good. And there I can see that I've, so this is just, as I said, using the Rudder Spock device client on my laptop. Uh, the gateway isn't involved. Uh, but there we can see the, the photo that I, oops, it's on this. So there's a very blurry photo of <laughs> what I took earlier. Well, um, that's the demo. So now, back on with the talk. So any questions about the demonstration at this stage, or shall I go on? Yes, please. Um, so what I have is basically uh, once it can't access, so if the, the gateway boots and can't access the Ceph cluster, so if you boot it without network access, then it uh, basically exposes the config because it knows something has to be done. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so next off, uh, I also wanted to use uh, the same thing for public cloud storage. So in this case, uh, if I didn't have a Ceph cluster at home, um, 
yeah, I, I could then use, say, a public uh, cloud storage provider like uh, Azure or um, Amazon S3 um, and use exactly the same technology or components to, uh, yeah, have a gateway for, for that. Uh, with uh, Microsoft Azure, um, there's basically a, a protocol or a RESTful protocol for accessing the virtual machine images in the Azure cloud. Um, so I wrote, uh, this was in a, a prior hack week, I wrote a client which speaks that protocol. Um, so the idea was then to um, yeah, basically map between the uh, SCSI requests coming in from the USB host into this um, Azure uh, RESTful uh, protocol for um, their blob I.O. So with this, um, I use the um, LIO, so internal SCSI target. Uh, with LIO, there's a user space backend, which is a TCMU runner. Uh, I think that was added by uh, Andy Grover from Red Hat uh, worked on that. Um, so basically with this backend, um, we have yeah, something running in user space, which then receives the SCSI request from the USB host. Um, with that backend, I just map that to then a, a public cloud request, so an Azure um, block blob request, and that goes into the cloud. So this uses the uh, Elasto Cloud client, um, which is a project I worked on for that. Um, this is basically just a, a POSIX-like uh, library for yeah, performing uh, RESTful Cloud I.O. Um, as I said earlier, I have then the LIO backend, which handles mapping of, of the SCSI requests to uh, the Elasto library calls. So it looks something like this for uh, the public cloud case. Here we have uh, the USB host on the left um, connected to the USB gateway. That goes, or the SCSI requests are then processed by the uh, Linux iSCSI target, or sorry, SCSI target. Um, there's TCMU uh, above or below that, um, basically as the user space backend. And finally, there's Elasto, which handles speaking with the uh, Microsoft Azure cloud. Okay. Um, Next up, testing. Um, yeah, so with this project, I didn't really want to, or at least initially, I was testing everything on the hardware itself, which is a little fiddly when you're, you know, plugging in, um, pulling out cables all day. Um, so I found later on there was this uh, dummy HCD module uh, within the Linux kernel. This is great for testing exactly uh, something like this, um, where basically uh, you're you can use that as a, as a loopback in a single system. So uh, in my case, I just had a VM with everything on there and uh, used the USB loopback functionality to test it. So now on to future challenges. Um, so in the hack week that I had, uh, or the one week I had, I think um, yeah, I proved that it is perfectly possible to, to to have something like this. I think it is a, a reasonable uh, device or something which is, is usable potentially to others. Um, but I think there are still yeah, plenty of, of things which, which could be done or it could be improved in many different ways. Um, yeah, the first on the list I have is, is con concurrent image access. So imagine where you have, uh, say, you know, if they cost under $10, then you could imagine maybe buying 10 of these and sort of exposing maybe the same image via these gateways. In that case, you would need a way to, to manage um, exposing a consistent image to all of those uh, hosts or connected hosts. In that case, I think um, using something, so yeah, avoiding a clustered file system and using something like uh, just snapshots where the first gateway to map sees or has right access to the, the parent um, and then any subsequent connects just get a, a snapshot which was taken as the first uh, host connected. Um, I think that may be uh, something which would, yeah, make having concurrent access usable anyway. Um, some other challenges. Um, so power is definitely a challenge. Um, I have had problems powering the board from 
yeah, portable devices like mobile phones, it's uh, yeah, really a little unsure whether uh, the board will come up or not. So one option would be to add a, a battery to the board so you're not so reliant on um, power from the USB host. Uh, FTCM, so this is the um, LIO uh, USB transport that plumbs straight into the, yeah, the Linux kernel SCSI targets. I didn't actually get that working on uh, the board, um, so I wanted to sort of have an, another play around with that and see whether yeah, it was a hardware issue or whether um, I just didn't set it up right. Caching, um, so many of these embedded boards have you know, uh, uh, some onboard storage or in this case an SD card um, and when the root file system is you know, under one gigabytes you could use the rest of that SD card or um, onboard storage for caching as a, a read cache or a, a write back cache. Um, that would certainly be something to look at. Um, oh, there's caching again. but. <laughs> Uh, performance wise, so I think at this stage most important would be the boot time. So you saw it takes yeah, tens of seconds to come up and expose the storage. Um, one thing I did have, or at least with the uh, QB truck, uh, I did try running everything from the init RAM FS, uh, which would actually worked quite well. So in that case I had it booting in, yeah, I think it was three or four seconds, so it was much quicker but it's a little ugly um, implementation wise. Also in terms of raw storage performance, um, I think having USB 3 and yeah, gigabit ethernet um, or fast Wi-Fi would be uh, yeah, great. The only problem is that these boards are quite expensive and they're also not as portable as, or at least the ones I've seen aren't as portable as the uh, Nano Pioneer. Um, in conclusion, uh, yeah, Ceph is, is fantastic. Um, uh, it, it solves all of your storage problems. I would just say, recommend using it. Uh, anyone that hasn't tried it out. Um, in terms of utilizing Ceph from yeah, many devices or opening up Ceph to many more devices, I think something like a USB gateway is uh, useful for that. I think it's a, a viable option for something like that. Um, I think as in particular um, using encryption on the board itself is particularly beneficial for uh, a public cloud or where it's backed by a public cloud. Um, yeah, uh, cheap hardware, um, really under $10 that makes something like this or a project like this quite, quite possible, quite viable. And, and having open source or uh, Linux kernel mainline mainline kernel support uh, for something like this is uh, hugely beneficial. But otherwise, looks like I'm a little early, but um, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to thank um, beforehand uh, the upstream Sunsea community for, for kernel hacking and getting these boards working. Uh, they do really an amazing job. And also, uh, so Andreas Ferber, uh, Dirk Muller, and uh, Alex Graf from SUSE, because they've also worked on the uh, open SUSE tumbleweed port for these, these boards. Um, otherwise, any questions? Uh, yes? What uh, boundaries were you able to achieve on USB 2 with uh, the UPG and the like? So the question was uh, what sort of band bandwidth or performance could I get with USB 2? Um, on the, so I mostly did benchmarking on the QB truck board, which has a, a gigabit ethernet port. Um, in that case, it was bottlenecked by the, the USB 2 port, and I think it was, yeah, it was sort of 10 to 15 megabytes per second um, throughput um, by USB to the, to the Ceph cluster. Um, in this case, my Ceph cluster is, is memory backed anyway, so yeah, the bandwidth, or oh, sorry, the bottleneck was, um, very much the uh, USB 2 port on the board. Um, other questions? Yes? Do you get that kind of throughput when you are encrypting, or is the CPU limiting you at that point? I haven't done um, benchmarks with encryption yet. So the all winner chips include basically um, yeah, offload support for certain um, encryption types. 
Um, it's not fully implemented on the H3 chip. Uh, so the A20, I think, was done. Uh, the H3 is still work in progress from the upstream Sun Sea guys. Uh, but yeah, I think once that's done, uh, it shouldn't be too much of a performance penalty. So the, the question was, have I considered uh, yeah, using a, a much smaller Linux distribution? Um, yeah, I work for SUSE, so obviously uh, playing with um, OpenSUSE is uh, something I like doing. Um, uh, but uh, that said, I could also, uh, so I, I mentioned I had it running from initramfs uh, on OpenSUSE. So I could also just um, build this in at RAMFS um, and do everything from that. In that case, it was also like 15 megabytes uh, with everything on there uh, to run this project. So it certainly is possible to use yeah, minimal um, setup and, and yeah, run everything uh, very quickly. Yes? Yes, sure. Yeah, yeah. well that's, so this is a problem with any uh, USB storage, right? Um, uh, normally I think most hosts are configured to do um, yeah, synchronous I.O. to the, the USB storage. Um, you should always eject the device before you unplug. Um, same goes for any other USB key, so I don't think it differs too much yeah. in that regard from a regular USB key. Yes. So uh, network outages. On from the USB gadgets, you still yeah. have to hold to push back everything to but, the, but this is uh, completely synchronous on the gateway side. So, um, yeah, it's not buffering anything. So, if you basically, if you lose network access, then you won't get successful, successful IOs on the USB side. So any USB request won't be acknowledged as successful until it's basically reached the Ceph storage and then Ceph obviously does its magic for replication at the back end. Once the gateway has a completion, uh, then it will finally acknowledge to the USB host that the IO is successfully complete. So um, yeah, it's really not, not doing much in that regard. Uh, there's no buffering on the gateway at, at this stage. One more question. Yes. So, so this, uh, so the question was, um, uh, how do you manage uh, accessing the configuration again? Um, this is something Lens asked earlier. Uh, so. Uh, basically, if the board comes up or the gateway comes up and can't access the Ceph cluster using the configuration that was provided, then um, it returns to exposing a configuration file system. And actually, it also copies the log onto the config file system, which is, for debugging, quite cool. So you can see, OK, um, it processed the config, couldn't connect to the Ceph cluster, or the, the image isn't there. Um, this is the error I get. And then, yeah, you can reconfigure your, your board at that stage. Yeah, exactly. So yes. You exactly. You can you can boot it with that network, and then you'll see your config again. Yeah. Yes, someone. Is it possible to expose more than one disk? So the question was um, whether more than one image could be exposed. Uh, yes. Um, at this stage, you saw the config file. Um, it's not really set up 
to handle that, but yeah, it would be easily doable. Um, so you could expose multiple images. Uh, the question is then whether the host supports multiple uh, LUNs or whether, say, your stereo or television, whether you can then access, um, say, LUN 1 or something aside from the, the default or the first. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, yes, one last. We get two codes somewhere. I'm guessing it's mostly two codes. Yeah, it's actually a pretty ugly shell script. Um, yeah, I, the reason why I wrote it in shell was because I was initially playing around with doing it from init RD, uh, in which case there's no Python, there's no Perl, there's no Go. Um, yeah, I think at this stage I prefer to rewrite it in um, something a little nicer. I was considering maybe a, a Rust project just so I can play with Rust, but yeah. Um, so the, the link for the, the code itself is just that top link um, for Elasto, so this um, cloud storage client. Um, it's also on GitHub. Uh, TCMU runner, so this was Andy Grover's <coughs> project. Um, yeah. There's the OpenSUSE link for uh, Tumbleweed on, on a lot of these arm boards, and of course the Sunsea community. Okay, well, thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>